Yes, thank you. Thank you. I guess actually a molecular biologist by training. Um, and then so, sorry, no, no. And so when I started my PhD, the first question I was asked is why do you want to do virology? Because I didn't know virology. And my answer has always been that viruses are the best molecular biologists out there. If you want to understand how cells work and how the, and how the immune system works, ask a virus. And, and, and so actually that's sort of my background. I, I think about cell biology, but from a virus point of view. And, and so for the sort of three lectures that I was going to um, give over the course of these two days, what I wanted to do was actually provide a very um, brief introduction to the herpes viruses. I wanted to go right back to the beginning in the same way, I guess, for the mathematics. For me, it's nice to go back to the beginning as well. Um, maybe it's... A, um, okay, the slide's not changed on the... Okay, it, uh, um, it's, oh, there you go. There you go. Uh, no, well, no, it's, it's on a different slide in front of me. Okay, that's strange. Okay. I think it's I think it's a delay actually. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so what I wanted to do is talk about the herpes virus family, uh, and particularly I'm going to focus on the herpes viruses that infect humans. Uh, I'm not um, so much not so much in the animal herpes viruses, and I think actually well, before we go into the sort of the very nitty gritty of latency and reactivation of these viruses. It's, it's, it's important to understand some basic concepts in herpes viruses and why they cause pathogenesis and what we see as pathogenesis of these viruses, because you see pathogenesis in, in, in very um, um, specific situations uh, in, in, in these, with these viruses. And this is probably the most mathematical slide I've got, and it's not very mathematical at all. And I use this slide really, um, no, it's, it's, it's just a delay, I think. I don't know why there's a delay. Yeah, yeah, because it's. Yeah, it's funny. It's on the, on the, on the, there you go. It's on my computer. It's changed. I don't know whether there's just a delay. So we're here now. Okay. Okay. Now we're now I'm jumping backwards and forwards now. <laughs> Sorry about this. It's a good job I've got. Uh, it's a short lecture, this one. Okay. We might be on the right one. Okay. Right. So this is my most mathematical slide. I use this slide for our undergraduates just to show that there are actually nine herpes viruses that infect humans. So, so classically, we've always, people always said there's eight, hence the designation of HHV 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. But um, the people who do, who do phylogeny, um, have now taken HHV 6 and split it into HHV 6A and 6B. And the important thing to say is, is that there are three families. There's the alpha herpes viruses, which we know as HSV1 and HSV2, and then varizella zoster virus, the virus of chickenpox. There's the gamma herpes viruses, Epstein-Barr virus, and then Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus, which are the really the, the oncogenic viruses. Right, okay, so all I really want to do with this slide is just show that there are three families of, of the herpes viruses. So I talked about the alphas and the gammas, and the ones that I'm particularly interested in are the beta herpes viruses and, and particularly cytomegalovirus. So I apologize in advance that a lot of what I talk about uh, when I talk about herpes viruses is really my focus on the cytomegalovirus, which is one of these herpes viruses. And I think the thing to take away from this is that the alphas, the alphas are probably the distinct ones genetically compared to um, the gammas and the betas. And we, we see that a little bit in the biology of these viruses as well. It tends to be more similar similarities between these families of virus than, than the alphas. I always feel like they're sort of the outpost, even though they were, I guess they're, they're the first as, as based on their designation. So what does the average herpes virus look like? And, and so the first thing to say about them is that they are large. They are the DNA, double standard DNA genomes, and they can be anywhere between 125 kV, which is the, the VZV genome, which is the smallest herpes virus, up to 240 kV, which is cytomegalovirus. That's a lot of coding capacity. If we think about HIV, which is around about 8 to 9 kV, uh, hepatitis C, again, is an 8 to 9 kV genome. These are large viruses genetically. And what that means is they have fantastic coding potential. And, and so, for example, that they can have anything between 70 to 200 canonical open reading frames. The CMV, for example, has around a predicted around 200 proteins. And what that means is, is this virus 
or these family of viruses really can manipulate the host cell. They are, and this is probably partly to do with their ability to establish latency, and some of these genes contribute to the ability to establish latency and be persistent in, in a host. That genome of a herpes virus is in, is in a proteinaceous core, and, and it's an icosahedral capsid. And again, it's quite large for a virus, 100 to 200 nanometers in diameter. So these are big, these are big viruses, not as big as vaccinia, but they are big viruses. When the virus is packaged, that capsid is surrounded by phosphor proteins. And, and so these phosphor proteins, were, essentially the virus comes into the cell ready with proteins that can manipulate the cell as it infects those cells. So it doesn't even need to express any of its genes. It's already got them pre-made, a number of those genes or those proteins there. Because they, and, what, and what they're coming in, of course, is to counter the host defense mechanisms and drive viral gene expression. So they come pre-made. All that is then encapsulated in um, an, an envelope. So it acquires an envelope from the plasma membrane as it buds out of the cell. And that envelope is then studded with lots of different glycoproteins. And these glycoproteins are the things that give the virus the tropism for the cells. And these are the things that will bind to the cell surface receptors and allow the virus to enter the cell. So for example, glycoprotein B in, in herpes viruses is the key fusogen. So it's equivalent to spike in SARS-CoV-2. It's the thing that drives virus entry. The difference between say something like SARS-CoV-2, which really utilizes spike for entry alone, these viruses have multiple glycoproteins. It's a very complicated entry process. And what it allows the virus to do is enter through different entry pathways through plasma membrane fusion, endocytosis, or even macropinocytosis. And of course, the, these viral glycoproteins are really important for the biology of the, of the virus and, and entry, but it also means that they are targets for the immune system. And so antibody responses against all these different glycoproteins could be neutralizing, and, and, and so the virus has a problem. It's got a trade-off here. It's got these glycoproteins that it needs for entry, but of course, they're juicy immunological targets uh, for the immune system. So again, if we look at the herpes virus life cycle and how the virus gets in, and this is plasma membrane fusion. So the virus binds at the plasma membrane, the plasma membrane then will then um, fuse uh, with the virus envelope. This releases the capsid, which uses actin cytoskeleton filaments to actually traffic to the nucleus. And those phosphor proteins, those tegument proteins that I talked about, will also traffic to the nucleus, but they actually traffic independently. So they don't go together. So the capsid goes by itself, and then the phosphor proteins traffic by themselves as well. And that actually will be important when I talk about the establishment of latency later. But the key point is, is that capsid then delivers that viral genome in, into the host nucleus. And you get initiation of viral gene expression. So remember, and, and, and I'll come on to talk about this a bit more, it's temporal. So the virus doesn't express all 200 genes at once. It actually will express them sequentially. Yeah, just the nucleus membrane. So actually, and so, and it's, so as an example, I guess, of, of, of how viruses have turned the cell against itself. So you, there's, there's a protein um, called Sting, which is an antiviral protein. And so it's interfering, stimulating. It's part of our DNA sensing pathway, which detects foreign infection and it activates interferon responses. Okay. This antiviral protein is, is potentially thought to be used by the capsid by binding to it and that and uses that protein to actually get into the nucleus. So the virus has actually turned the defense mechanism against itself. And this is, this is why viruses are so clever. In, well, anthropomorphically, they're so clever. They don't know what they're doing. Of course, evolution is driving it. But the point is, it's using actually a viral, potentially a host protein to get across that nuclear membrane and it's a host innate immune system. And so it's turning it against itself. And so the capsid goes in and, the, and yet releases the viral DNA and the thing about the herpes virus is they have their own DNA polymerase. They don't need the cellular DNA polymerase to replicate their genome. They, they come, they have, because of that, that, that coding capacity, they have their own DNA polymerase. They use the host RNA polymerases. They don't have their own RNA polymerase, but they use their own DNA polymerase. You get viral replication. And, the, and so the other thing to bear in mind about herpes viruses is that their replication cycle is quite slow. So, so for example, vaccinia, the virus that causes smallpox, can make new viruses within eight hours. 
cytomegalovirus that I work on can take three to four days. So it, it can, so it's a slow process. The DNA polymerase has proofreading capacity, so it can actually um, uh, proofread the DNA it's replicating. And ultimately what you get is, is viral replication, formation of cap, new capsids in the nucleus. The DNA is then inserted into that capsid. The capsid leaves the nucle nucleus into the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, into the viral assembly compartment. That's where it acquires all those fossil proteins. They package up with the virion, interplasm membrane, and then you get new viruses. So that's the classic herpes virus life cycle. That's how it would do it in a lytic infection. But of course, the point I'm here today is to talk about latency. And so a key decision point that, I'll, that you have to bear in mind when you think about herpes viruses occurs at this very early stage. So in lytic infection and in latent infection, the capsid will enter the nucleus and deliver the viral genome. But the decision point comes at whether you get viral gene expression. And in latency, you do not get lytic viral gene expression. And I'll come on to discuss what those viral gene products are. And it's the inhibition of that initiation of lytic viral gene expression, which is thought to cause the virus to default potentially into latent infection, which is a, which is a, a non-lytic infection. So thinking about the pathogenesis of these viruses before we get on to, on to more of the aspects of the molecular biology of latency, what are these different families of viruses? And so I remember I said there's three, type, there's three families essentially. And so the alpha herpes virus is the ones we know um, quite well. Um, so herpes simplex one and two. And simplex one is a really traditionally associated with cold sores, which is, a, which is a really bounce of periodic reactivation of this virus. And then herpes simplex two really with gen genital infections, genital lesions. The key biological characteristic of these, these viruses is that they establish lifelong latency in neuronal cells. And whilst latency itself is not considered to be pathogenic, the reactivation of this virus can lead to quite serious disease. And so you get corneal keratitis or blindness or encephalitis. So the virus reactivates and then infects tissue in the brain and causes a, a quite severe disease in, in specific patient populations. The other alpha herpes virus is varicella zoster virus, the virus that causes what we call chickenpox or reactivation, which we know as shingles. And again, this is a virus that infects epithelial cells. We see the rash, oh, sorry, we see a rash, sorry, this is a shingles rash, sorry. But we see a rash on, 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 on infected in, uh, children normally, that's when we acquire the virus, if we haven't had the vaccine. Then the primary infection leads to the establishment of latency, again, in neuronal cells. And then you may see bouts of reactivation under certain clinical situations. And that's, how, that's what we see as the zoster rash, which we see here. And again, it can be self-limiting, of course, it can be, it can be very painful, but actually it can be life-threatening in, in, in certain situations. And so latency and reactivation is really important for the pathogenesis of these viruses. The same is also true in, in the beta herpes viruses. Um, slight difference here with, with I get, well, actually, I'm going to say a slight difference in CMV, but actually all herpes viruses tend to be asymptomatic. In, in, in healthy people, you might get mild symptoms, but it's, it's in people with, the, with immune systems which are impaired that we see problems. And we're interested in the CMV particularly because it's a really important congenital infection. And so the CMV can transmit across the, the placenta bound, boundary. You get infection, uh, um, and in congenital infection, and we get we can see disease in, in, in babies when they're born. And, and what we know about CMV, unlike the alpha herpes viruses, it establishes latency in myeloid hematopoietic cells, which are in our bone marrow. These are the cells that give rise to all our immune cells. So the site of latency is very different to the alpha herpes viruses. But I'll come on to discuss in future lectures is that mechanisms are the same, even if the key players are different. There are, con there are conserved mechanisms between these different viruses. The important thing here is with CMV is that when the virus reactivates, the trigger for reactivation is when our bone marrow cells turn into immune cells and so populate in our blood. So the CD34 bone marrow cells are the cells that give rise to all our immune cells, our T cells, B cells, and NK cells, macrophages, monocytes, dendritic cells. 
all and, and this happens on a daily basis. The, so CD34 cells leave the bone marrow to make our immune system. And of course, if the CD34 cells are leaving the bone marrow, virus can leave the bone marrow with those CD34 cells into those mature cells. And as I said, it's, whilst it's asymptomatic in, our, in, in healthy people, if you get infection in immune compromised populations or transplant populations, this is why I work at the Royal Free Hospital in, in London, which is one of the major transplant centers. And I'll come on to show you, it's a, it's a real problem in our transplant patients. And so immunosuppressed transplant patients, but also, of course, the immune naive fetus that I alluded to already. The other beta herpes viruses, and much actually less is known about these viruses. CMV has always been the poster child for the beta herpes viruses due to the clinical presentation. The Rizzler viruses are quite a, a, um, an intriguing set of viruses, actually. They infect T cells, also, but also can infect monocytes. They cause what we call roseola in infants, which is like a rash phenotype in, in children that are infected. Tend, again, this tends to be self-limiting. An interesting little caveat to these viruses is that most herpes viruses are episomal. So HIV, for example, is a virus that integrates into the host genome. That's how it establishes latency. Herpes viruses don't do that. The, the viral genome stays as an episome. So it's, it's completely separate um, to the host genome. It doesn't integrate. There's some evidence suggests that these are the exception. So HHV 6 and 7 may integrate into the, viral, in, into the host genome. Does, not all the viral genomes will do that, but some do. And the biological consequence of that is not clear yet. Uh, but there's very little actually known about these viruses. Only for the only for only for HHV six and seven. So that's the only time you'll see some integration. For all the others, HSV1, 2, VZV, CMV, EBV, and, and, and KSHV, it's, it's episomal. It ex it's, it, it, it doesn't matter. It could be latent or lytic. It doesn't integrate. It's all infections. It will not integrate. It's, 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 we don't really know why we see this HHV6 and 7 integration and what role it serves. Um, it's, it's, it could be just a, a strange event we can't explain. It, yeah, so when you said there's a lifelong latency or there's a long period of time for the virus, it's inside the cell. Uh, the the yeah, so, so it's the, not the virus, it's the genome. The genome. Yeah, so the, so the genome is delivered into the cell, into the nucleus, and then it just sits there like a piece of DNA. And, and essentially, I think of it as an extra chromosome. It becomes, and I'll, as I'll come on to discuss in the other lectures, it becomes regulated by essentially the things that host, regulate host eukaryotic gene expression. It's the, it, it, and you can think of it as another chromosome. Okay. Very well, good question. So the the estimation of latency can only occur in two places that are relatively similar to birth. Yeah. So, so it's very cell type specific. And again, I'll, I, I'll come on to discuss this in a bit about the cell types that are important for latency. It's very cell type specific. So if, for example, CMV will lytically infect most cells, most differentiated cells, an endothelial cell, epithelial cell, fibroblast, neuronal cell, smooth muscle cell, it will go lytic in those cells. So it's, latency is a very restricted phenotype in a very specific population of cells. And it'll be different for different families and so, as I said, HSV is out, and the alphas tend to go into the neural cells and establish latency. Well, they do, or not tend to, they do go latent in those cells. CMV is in the CD34 cells, whereas, as was discussed with the gammas, it tends to be B cells. And actually, that's, that's linked to their pathogenesis uh, as well. And so it's very specific cell types. So they, so they all infect epithelial cells. That's how they get in mucosal membranes. And then they then they traffic, and then there's a, yeah they have specific cells that they infect. So in a way, latency sort of like helps them explore other systems. Well, that's I guess that's for discussion. You know, what is the role of latency? Um, and and uh, I guess I can I'll, I'll probably come on to a little bit of that in the, in this lecture. Um, but yeah, it's it's why do we, why do these what is the biological advantage of latency? Is there one? Or is it just a quirk of cell biology? And we'll discuss that.
So with the, with the gamma herpes virus, lytic infection is in epithelial cells against infection at mucosal or membranes. And then you get establishment of latency in B cells. It's the main cause of glandular fever or infectious mononucleosis. And so it's very common in, in new students when they start university, because um, it's also known as the kissing disease. And, it, and it's, it's, and again, it, it, people who've had glandular fever, you're, 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 you know, you remember, you feel run down, but actually it, become, it, 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 it resolves itself eventually. But every now and again, you have maybe bouts of stress and you may feel run down, the immune system gets depressed and the virus can reactivate and you get that sort of tiredness we associate with glandular fever. But it tends to be self-limiting. The problems arise with, with both um, EBV and KSHV is the fact that it's oncogenic. And so, so as I'll come to discuss a little bit more, how gamma herpes virus has established latency it's a little bit different to how alpha and beta herpes viruses establish latency. So when a gamma herpes virus infects a B cell, it transforms the B cell. It makes it into a long lived B cell. And it has, so it does that. So essentially what it's doing is transforming the cell. Now it's not a malignant transformation, but of course what can happen is if that's now a transformed B cell, which the virus is keeping alive and does acquire further mutations, it can become a malignant B cell and, and lead to a lot of the B cell driven diseases, cancers that we see. So Hodgkin and Burkitt lymphoma. We also see, actually see T and NK cell lymphomas with these viruses. And the one that, and with KSHV, it really came to prominence, of course, in the AIDS epidemic. So people, a lot of people infected with KSHV wasn't a problem because our immune system was controlling this virus. In the 1980s, in the AIDS epidemic, of course, the, the HIV infection leads to acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. You've lost that immuno immunological control of herpes viruses, which are, of, of course, we're infected with. And so KSHV particularly became a real, real problem. And so you get KSHV sarcoma on the skin, uh, which is, uh, and then, of course, we also see CMV reactivations and we get blindness. And so one of the defining characteristics in the 1980s of the AIDS epidemic, a number of AIDS patients went blind, and that was CMV-induced retinitis. It's a very peculiar biological phenotype. CMV doesn't normally cause retinitis. It's not one of the major presentations of CMV in immunosuppressed people, except in the HIV population. And we don't quite know why that is the case. But it was, a, it, it was one of the defining, one of the defining clinical symptoms. So if we talk about clinical herpes, tends to be limited pathology. Cold sores in, in the alphas and, the, and zoster and shingles and reactivation events in, in, the, in, chicken, in the varicella. Glandular fever, which is the Epstein-Barr virus one nucleosis, or even CMV infection. You get, you get like a cold-like symptoms for a few days. People often don't even know they've been infected with cytomegalovirus, for example, often because it doesn't have a pre clinical presentation. The issues arise in those patients without an immune response. And so congenital infection, the fetus doesn't really have much immunity, if any, it definitely does not have adaptive immunity, it doesn't have T cells. And so if the virus crosses the placenta, it can cause serious disease. Transplant patients, we're transplanting more and more people every year, bone marrow transplants, solid organ transplants. So I think there's 100,000 solid organ transplants last year. This is a problem because these viruses, are, as you're going to see, are very prevalent. So I would predict everyone in this room has got at least one herpes virus. You've probably got three or four. I don't want to suggest anything about your lifestyle choices, but it's, we're carrying these viruses. A CMV, for example, 50% of this room is probably infected with CMV. And so it becomes a problem in the transplant because you may have got the virus and receiving the transplant, but also you may be receiving an organ from somebody who's got the virus. And so the virus comes with the organ. And so it's a multiple problems. It's your own virus could be a problem or it could be the donor's virus that could be the problem. And so only the other week we saw about um, the Zena transplantation, the pig transplant, the pig heart. They think the virus that caused the rejection was a pig CMV virus. Now it shouldn't have been a pig CMV virus. Those pigs should have been clean, but actually they think that was the cause. So it's because the pig CMV virus reactivated in the, in the pig's heart caused graft versus host disease, it triggers inflammation, and they think that's why the heart failed. And so if you can clean, keep the pigs clean and, um, and pore signs CMV, 
we might be we might be able to go back to xenotransplantation. Okay. Okay. So I want a little bit. I'm going to, I want to talk a little bit about um, CMV infection. Okay. So it's just gone into sleep mode again. Sorry about this. So CMV first came to medical attention back in 1910. So the virus wasn't actually isolated to 1953. But what they noticed was is that when they looked in stillbirths, they could see these owl's eye inclusions. They didn't know what it was, but they, they thought it was an infection. What we know now know is a viral infection. And this, one of the characteristics of the CMV infection is that the cells become enlarged, hence its name, cytomegalovirus, the big cell virus. And what we now know about this virus and what people really aren't aware of it concerning the CMV, it's the leading viral cause of disease in congenital infection. So around about one in every 100 to 150 children born in the world were born with the CMV infection. Um, of that, 20 to 30% will have CMV disease. So it's much bigger than the Zika virus infection and congenital infection. And actually the levels mimic rubella before we had a vaccine. And this is why the funding agencies, this is why the clinical um, uh, agencies are interested in CMV. It's a major problem. And so you can get, again, you can get two forms of CMV infection congenitally. Primary infection, so the woman is seronegative, she's never had CMV, she gets infected with CMV. She has a limited, self limited disease, limiting disease. The problem is she transmits the virus to the fetus, and then the fetus gets disease. The other aspect is that the mother can be seropositive and already have the virus, the virus reactivates, and that virus could potentially transmit to the fetus. And, and so it's a major problem. And it's, so Primary infection of seronegative women is more of a problem in the Western world where CMV rates are going down. But in, in, in places, what we say, of low socioeconomic status, where in fact CMV infection rates are much higher, so 80 to 90%, it's reactivation. The other thing is, as I'll come on to discuss later, is that CMV can reinfect. So even having some CMV immunity from a prior infection doesn't mean to say you can't be reinfected. And this is really important to, for the biology of latency, and I'll come on to, to that a bit later. So these are just the numbers. I'm not going to go through, I'm not, I'm not going to go through the numbers um, when, when they come up. I'll go through the numbers. <laughs> but essentially, it's about the US calculated that it takes around, it's about two billion pound, two billion dollars, sorry, a year to treat the, the consequences of CMV infection. And so there are three viruses which were considered to be highest priority for CMV vaccine, HI, sorry, for a vaccine, HIV, CMV, and hep C. Um, hep C, less so now, because you've got really good antivirals, but HIV and CMV are the, are the highest priority um, pathogens. The other thing, just, just, just to give some numbers, just to, just to reiterate why it's important in, 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 in pathology, it's, like it's a major source of disease in immunosuppressed transplant patients. But note here, HSV, VZV. So the herpes virus is a real problem. And that's because we're immunosuppressing these people. And of course, we're immunosuppressing the people, we're losing the immunological control of these viruses. How do we treat um, herpes viruses? We have a number of different strategies. And again, so there's a delay on the slides so we'll here in a minute. Um, we have we have inhibitors of DNA polymerase, um, acyclovir and gancyclovir. So they actually target the viral DNA polymerase. And what that essentially does is it, bring, it introduces toxic versions of nucleotides into the viral genome. And that causes cell death. Of course, whilst this, they are considered to be virus specific, they couldn't be incorporated into replicating DNA host DNA. And of course, that causes toxicity. We do, despite skepticism, we do have a vaccine for at least one herpes virus, VZV, but it can still get zoster. It can, that vaccine is, is attenuated and it can reactivate. So it's not, it's not a sterilizing vaccine. There are a number of CMV vaccines and EBV vaccines under trial. I think EBV will come back into vogue because of the link with MS and, and wanting to vaccinate against EBV. 
and, and, and then T-cell therapy. Of course, a lot of these therapies don't necessarily deal with the, the latent virus. And, and what we're really trying to understand is, is what's the biology of latency? How do we get rid of the latent virus? Okay, so that's the clinical perspective. And, I, and I, now I want to very briefly talk about the biological properties, which is really important for the remaining, remaining talks that I'm going to give, the, 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 the biological properties of, of herpes viruses. And, and, the, and the first biological property is temporal gene expression. So you've got, two, you've got up to 200 genes you deliver that viral genome into the cell. It's probably not advantageous just to express everything all at once to the virus. And what the, vi what the viruses actually do is they express things in, in, in sequential order. So, so we, and, and it falls into really three classes of genes. And, and this is, you'll hear this a lot in herpes virology. They'll talk about the temporal cascade of gene expression. They'll talk about immediate early genes, they'll talk about early genes, and they'll talk about late genes. And this is all based on the work of uh, Bernard Reutzman and Bob Honus back in 1974, who showed this for herpes simplex virus originally. And what it essentially deals with is this idea that the virus will come in, express a subset of genes, they take over the cell, they take over cell cycle, they take over the, the and to get the cell ready for replication. They take over the immune system, and particularly the innate immune system. And then you have the early genes, which they drive the expression of, which are the beta or the betas. And these are the DNA replication machinery. This is how the virus now makes new. So it's got control of the cell with IE, and now it starts to replicate its own genomes with early. And then we've got the gammas, which is a basically the new viruses, those capsid proteins, those fossil proteins, the glycoproteins, okay. And so what's important here is these IE genes. And I'm gonna talk about these a lot when I talk about latency because that's the decision point for latency. If the, I don't know why it's gone right back to the start now. It's not gone to start. <laughs> Okay, sorry about this. Okay. So these, so what these genes are, so what, what's important is this IE regulation. Now, what you'll find is these are historic, and of course it started in 1974, they use very broad inhibitors, inhibitors of transcription, inhibitors of translation, inhibitors of DNA replication to define these genes. As technology progresses, you can do this with more resolution. So proteomic approaches have, have essentially said that this is a bit more detail, a bit more granularity, single cell analyses, you get more granularity, but actually what these papers actually show is those original experiments based on biochemical data are largely correct. They've just got more granularity. An important point from here, which is actually what I'm important to talk about today, is they sort of confer this, this paper here confirmed the importance of regulating IE gene expression for the establishment of latency. So this is a common theme that feeds through. So I've talked a lot about clinical pathogenesis, talked about the basic property of gene expression, not really touched on latency. So I want to finish now by, and talk about actually talk about the thing I'm here to talk about, which is latency and reactivation. And this is really is a defining biological characteristic. And in fact, if you talk to some herpes viruses, they say that no, the virus has latency. They are very, can be very dogmatic over this. HIV is a persistent virus, which has some latency in it, but it, they, they can be quite dogmatic. Uh, herpes virus, it's the characteristic of of, of herpes viruses. And really latency and reactivation, that's the fundamental point here. It's not just latency, it's the fact that the virus can reactivate. So what biological advantage does latency provide? This ability of the virus to go to ground when it infects an individual. So most viruses will come in, replicate and move on. And, that, and that's success uh, in that respect. So what about 
um, context of, of, of viral latency. Well, or, or why would this be important? And again, I apologize, the delay, the, the, the delay on the slides. But if you think about what a virus has to do, it has to infect a host, replicating that host, may have to infect more cells, enhance replication. And then there's a, there's a decision point. The, the pathogen will kill the host if the infection is not resolved, or the infection is resolved because the immune system gets control. But in that window, if that virus infects a new host, then arguably it's success. And we, we sort of think of actually the, the primary success criteria for any virus is transmission. And we see that with SARS-CoV-2. It's arguably not a more pathogenic virus than the original SARS-CoV virus from 2003. What it is, is it's much better at transmitting. And so it's spread out through the world. And so we see more disease associated with that virus. But I argue, if you would put them side by side, you'd say the original SARS was more pathogenic. It just wasn't very good at transmitting. And that was our saving grace with the first, uh, first SARS-CoV infections. So transmission really is the important thing. So in that, in that sense, does latency actually provide an advantage in transmission for herpes viruses? Is this why it provides a biological advantage? Because if you think about what, if viruses are obligate parasites, they can't live outside a host. They need a reservoir. And so there's, a, there's three related solutions. There's a, there's, a, there's a solution where the host species, where the organism isn't pathogenic. And we see that with bats, for example, there's loads of viruses living in bats, they don't cause any disease. They come out of the bats and infect us. Influenza has host species where it's less pathogenic and it will jump into humans. There's a persistent infection in the host species. We see that with hepatitis infections or a latent infection. Now, persistence and latency arguably could be the same, or two sides of the same coin. Um, but arguably, is latency an important solution? Okay. So what I'm going to argue today and is that latency is a solution to that. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a solution that aids the transmission of these viruses. Because the, one of the key things about herpes viruses is they're incredibly uh, um, tr trans transmissible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I, sorry, it's, it's, I, I'm sort of trying to jump ahead so to, to keep the slides coming. Okay, right. So now we're on to latency. So how do we define viral latency? There's lots of very nuanced descriptions of viral latency. But actually, this is a very simple definition of latency, and I think one that works. And if you have this in your mind, then all the sort of nuances of, of viral latency then can be put onto this. A latency is essentially the persistence of the viral genome in the nucleus, and that can be for days, months, years, in an absence of lytic gene expression or replication, and not making in new infectious viruses. but the virus has to retain the capacity to re-enter the lytic life cycle. It has to be able to reactivate. And in fact, reactivation is, in my mind, is what defines latency. Because if the virus can't reactivate, it's arguably not latent. What it is, it's, it's stuck in a dead end, it's in an aborted infection. It can't get out. It's just gone somewhere and it can't get out. So if the virus actually can't remain functional and come out and make new viruses, that for me is the simplest definition of latency. The key thing is, this is not the same definition as clinical latency. And so you could be infected with a virus. Hepatitis could be a good example of that, which is replicating at lower levels and you can't detect it. And so clinically you're latent because there's no evidence of viral replication, but that virus is replicating. What we're talking about here is in cellular latency is that the virus isn't replicating or it's not, it's not replicating to make new viruses. So what I want to now finish the talking about is how latency is established and, and what the cell types which are important. And I, I, I 
I apologize for slightly over I think that's I guess it's part of the computing errors, uh, computing issues we're having. So I've got a completely different slide again to what you can see. Um, so what you need for latency, I can tell you this, is a cell type that supports via an infection. That infection is non-lytic. A mechanism to prevent viral gene expression, that's particularly lytic IE gene expression. This latent cell needs to be um, uh, viable and the viral genome needs to be maintained. And that viral genome maintenance could be different for different latent viruses. So you can integrate HIV, for example. Integration is a, is a, is a mechanism of maintenance because it now becomes part of the host replication machinery. You replicate the viral genome during latency. We see that with Epstein-Barr virus. You infect a cell that doesn't replicate. That's, how, that's the alpha herpes virus solution. So neuronal cells don't replicate. And so CMV, has, we don't know the solution to CMV. What we think is it receives the latent reservoir. So you go through constant bouts of latency and reactivation and, and, and receive the uh, reservoir. The key thing is, of course, the latent infected cell in the reservoir has to evade immune recognition. And so if you want to study the molecular biology of CMV, of a herpes virus latency, we need to understand what cell types is in. And I've already alluded to this in the clinical aspect of it. But the thing to take away is that most of the herpes viruses are latent in cells in our blood system. So human sites of megalovirus is latent in bone marrow precursor cells and in monocyte population. The, um, B, the gamma herpes viruses are latent in, in B cells. HIV, which is obviously not a herpes virus, that's latent in, in T cells. So all these different viruses are actually latent in cells in the blood system. In fact, the exception is the alpha herpes virus, which, which in fact they are differentiated neuronal cells. So you're about two slides behind me. I think people online can see. Um, so what is it about the hematopoietic lineage that makes it a good site of latency or potentially a good site of viral latency? What is it about these cells which make them sites of CMV latency? And are they good? Well, the first thing about these cells is that they're circulating, they're going all around the body. And that might be important for dissemination because they also cause the disseminate, they will circulate and go to mucosal membranes that repli cause replication. So maybe that's why, it's, that's why they're important. The other aspect about cells in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, hematopoietic system is that they have distinct profiles of activation. Uh, and so they have different um, biology. So a CD34 cell is very different to a dendritic cell and a resting T cell is very different to an activated T cell. And of course, what I've said is, is that these latent viruses are essentially genetic units which are behaving like eukaryotic genes. And so we know that cellular gene expression is differentially regulated in cells through different, uh, different um, cell types. Maybe the herpes virus are just using the piggybacking onto that differential regulation of gene expression to regulate their own genes. And so you've got differentiated and undifferentiated things. The downside to this, is that the virus is reactivating in the, in the epicenter of the immune response. Is this a bad thing? You've also got dividing cells. If you've not got a mechanism of replication or maintenance, is this not a problem? You're not gonna lose your latent virus infection. Or in fact, if you're being cynical, is the hematopoietic system the site of latency for all these viruses? Because that's the system that we can easily, most easily access. And are there tissue resident sites of latency that we don't know about? We can easily get peripheral blood out of people. We can analyze peripheral blood. I like to think it's the former. Actually, these, this, these population of cells allow or sort of support the molecular biology that I'm going to talk about in the context of, of, of latency and reactivation. So how is cell identity important in, in, in latency and reactivation? And how can we suggest how this is important for regular regulation. So I'm going to use cytomegalovirus as an example, and, and I hopefully the, the slide is going to go up any minute now. Um, 
but CMV establishes latency in CD34 bone marrow progenitor cells. An important biological characteristic of CD34 progenitor cell is that it gives rise to all your immune cells, not just monocytes, so T cells, B cells, monocytes, NK cells, et cetera. What we know about the virus, if we look where the virus is trafficking, we see that the virus is trafficking in the myeloid lineage. So it's not in T cells. It's not in B cells. It's not even in neutrophils. So despite the fact that the virus is here in this pluripotent progenitor, it's going down the myeloid lineage and ultimately reactivates in dendritic cells. And what we now think that is happening is, is that the virus may well be directing this. So, so the virus doesn't like T cells. It doesn't like B cells because it can't replicate in these cells. So there's a hypothesis actually the virus expresses gene products during latency, which actually drive the cell and commit the cell into a myeloid lineage. So, but why do you get latency in the first place? This is the, this is the question that we want to address. Why is it about this bone marrow cell which drives latency versus a dendritic cell which drives reactivation? And in fact, if you infect those cells, they go lytic. It all comes back to the regulation of that promoter, that the major media promoter. And what you see is that this cellular environment is less permissive for the expression of that promoter. And now this is a promoter actually in CMV, which is actually using every plasmid that everyone ever uses in the, in the lab. It's the most powerful promoter in biology. But actually what we, what we, what's important is that that promoter is, is, is repressed. And what we, what we have is in a lytic infection, the promoter is active, all the genes are expressed, replication. If that promoter is inhibited, the IE promoter, you get repression of IE and you get latency. The key thing here is that it's not, a, I guess it's a, a takeaway message for anything else that these viruses are not dormant in latency. They are active. So it seems like an oxymoron to say something is actively latent. But they are doing stuff in latency, these viruses. They're not sat there silently. And, and, and that's, we'll, we'll come on to that. So, very briefly, are there parallels with HIV latency? So, HIV infects T cells. So, an activated T cell will support HIV replication. In contrast, HIV infects a resting T cell, it may go into a latent infection, i.e., it will not go lytic. And so again, it's a similar idea. It's different cells, but it's a similar idea. It's a different cell env cellular environment. It's a cellular environment that's dictating whether the virus goes latent. It's not the virus that's making that decision. It's the host environment. And so in the first hypothesis, actually the CD4 T cells are being infected and potentially a subset becoming going to latency, but actually hopefully in the second hypothesis, it was easy to see, it's actually, it's the, the T cells themselves are, dr are driving HIV latency. I think Leo Weinberg will probably may disagree with this when, in their talk, because I think the HIV field is moving on to more st stochastic view of why the virus goes latent. But what's key, and what, or, or conceptually what's key is it's that cellular environment that the virus meets which is important. And so resting T cell has high levels of viral inhibitors. So cellular inhibitors of viral replications, in this case, a protein called SAMHD1, which restricts DNTP availability to the virus. The virus goes latent, and then you get an activation stimuli, and the virus will reactivate. Alternatively, you've got proliferation T cell and lytic infection. And as, as always the case that there are two competing hypotheses, but actually I think both are true. So a proliferating T cell can go lytic, can also go into a latent infection, and a resting T cell is more likely to go into latent infection. We also see this with um, Epstein-Barr virus, and, and they'll come up in a minute, hopefully. So Epstein-Barr virus infects B cells, and again, those B cells can go into different patterns of latency. 
So you may have heard of Epstein Barr virus. It has latency zero, latency one, latency two, latency three. And these are essentially definitions of gene expression. And what happens is when the EBV infects the B cell, it goes through latency phase three, it gets, expresses a number of proteins, which essentially take over the cell, immortalize it, starts to restrict gene expression, and ultimately you end up as a memory B cell where the virus has transformed that B cell and now has established latency. That B cell then can be activated into a plasma cell and the activation of the B cell into a plasma cell is a trigger for viral reactivation. So the virus is essentially taking the same signal that activates that B cell into a plasma cell and using it to reactivate it because this is, a, this is a cell that ultimately may end up dying. So the virus is it's a, it's a get out signal. And so the virus, the EBV is piggybacked onto B cell biology. So I'm just gonna finish and ask a few questions, what hopefully we'll come on to after lunch and, and address in more detail. And, and, and I wanna go back to that question about whether latency provides, or the ability to establish a latent infection provides a biological advantage to the viruses. So what does latency allow a virus to do? It allows the virus to persist in the host, there's no immune clearance. So there's not sterilizing immunity against, herpes, against these herpes viruses. And so what I will tell you is that if you were to take somebody who's infected with cytomegalovirus and take their blood and analyze their T cells, you would find 10 to 15% of their T cells recognize CMV. The immune system devotes an exceptional amount of energy towards the control of cytomegalovirus and actually Epstein-Barr virus as well. There's a lot of, so you have a lot of T cells against Epstein-Barr virus. So if you think about that, all those different infections that you've seen in your lifetime, you've generated cell-mediated immunity to, yet you have one to two viruses, EBV and CMV, dominating that immune response. The immune system obsesses over these herpes viruses. Despite the fact we've got this prodigious immune response against CMV, it doesn't control it. And that's in part due to the ability of the virus to establish latency. It goes to ground, it's hiding from the immune system. But what we think is important is, is that what we know about herpes viruses is they're highly seroprevalent. And they haven't got great R numbers. They're not really infectious viruses. They're not like measles. Measles is, is, is the poster child for infection. That's got that kind of R numbers up to 40, R O number, sorry. CMV is not that good at infecting, funny enough. But what, it, what we think it does do, it has lots of goes. So through, through periodic latency and reactivation, it has, it'll have multiple efforts at transmitting and eventually it does it. Uh, and so in a major route of transmission, for example, is in women who are breastfeeding and, and they, they transmit the virus to the, um, to the feeding neonate. And so, it's, it's, like, and so it's, just, it's having lots of goes is that actually the solution that herpes viruses have, have, have possibly found. I'm going to say here that latency is not considered to be pathogenic, although that might not be true. And, and we'll come on to discuss that in a bit more detail in, in further lectures. Because the latency isn't making new viruses, it's considered that actually it's not causing significant pathology in people. And actually we see pathogenesis with herpes viruses only in, in really in clinical settings when we immunosuppress people with transplant or in primary immunodeficiency patients who have got no immune system or in congenital infection. It, so it's a very iatrogenic situation. It's where we're, we're changing the immune system to do things. And that's where the virus causes the disease. And, and that makes sense because I've just told you that the, the immune system is dedicating a lot of resources to controlling this virus. And so if you immunosuppress that individual and get rid of that immune response, of course, the virus has now got a window to reactivate and cause disease. You've lost that control. So these viruses are not quiescent. They're not, not doing anything. Actually, they're probably like a dog strain on a leash. They're trying to go all the time and reactivate, but the immune system is controlling them. But as soon as you take that immune system away with immune suppression, the viruses just go. And that's why we see them often as the first virus in our transplant patients. So they're not dormant. They're not sat doing nothing. We think they're actually right on the edge and they're ready to go all the time. And then as soon as you, mute, or as soon as you immunosuppress, they're ready to go.
So I just want to fin finish two slides. It might take me about 10 minutes to do two slides where it's jumping backwards and forwards. Is I've talked about clinical herpes having limited pathology in healthy individuals. And actually, it's all about people who are immune suppressed or have got no immune system. So transplant patients, AIDS patients, and congenital infection. But I think an important thing that is emerging from the study of herpes viruses is that they're perhaps not quite as benign as we thought they were in healthy people. And so, so for some herpes viruses, you're living with them for 60, 70 years of your life. So chicken pox, most children acquire that as a child. CMV, probably the major time of transmission is, is in childhood. So people have CMV for a long time. Epstein-Barr virus, you probably have it for 60, 70 years. And what we're now seeing is some new reports that suggest that Epstein-Barr virus is associated with MS. And, and we don't know fully the mechanism of this. But the important thing is, is that the immune response that's been driven against Epstein-Barr virus and the hyperimmune response might be contributing to some autoimmunity. And we've seen that in, in, in MS. And actually, there's links between herpes viruses and, and the hyperimmune response in other autoimmune diseases. There's also the concept of immune senescence. So as I said, the immune system is obsessing over these viruses. At the, and is it doing it at the expense of immune responses against other pathogens and actually against vaccines? And so there is some data, for example, in the most recent SARS-CoV-2 studies, which suggest that people who are old and CMV positive do worse in, in their vaccine response. Because again, there's just not the capacity, there's not the space in the immune response for any new responses. There's links with the Epstein-Barr virus and malaria, and again, overactivation and, and triggering links with cancer. So, so EB, but it's not EBV, it's EBV driven cancers, but it's all the hyperimmune responses. And finally, last, this is the last point. We always think it's the enemy, but actually, could they be our friend as well? And so, there's work from uh, Skip Virgin, which has been an animal model, this is my only animal herpes um, comment. He showed that in gamma herpes virus infection in mice protected those mice from infection with challenge, with, I think it was of pestis. And it was down to a hyped up interfering response to the gamma herpes virus infection, which activated macrophages, which was protecting actually the mouse against the pestis challenge. And so, it, and argue, so is the herpes virus protecting its niche? Again, we, we don't know. And finally, CMV vaccines against HIV. So as I've said, CMV induces a fantastic immune response. And so people are working on whether you can use that fantastic immune response that you get against the herpes the CMV and drive it against something like HIV. So put gag protein into a HCMV vector because HIV does not have anything like the immune evasion strategies that CMV has. So HIV is considered not to be able to avoid this immune response. So I'll finish there and I apologize it's overrun um, and hopefully we can get the tech stuff sorted out after, after lunch, <laughs> sorry about that. But what to do is introduce the sorts of the, uh, I guess it's quite the basic concepts of, of pathogenesis of these viruses and why hopefully studying latency and reactivation is important for that. So I'll, I'll stop there. So.